Hello and welcome to another session of The Change Exchange, where we talk to people about the change moments in their lives. You know, it happens to all of us when your life suddenly takes a different tack. And sometimes it's because of circumstance and sometimes it's because of decisions we make. But it's always interesting to see how people come to those points and how they respond to it. And today, I have a lovely guest, Mochadisi Mukhono. She's a rugby girl. She's a rugby host on Supersport, the first woman to anchor a final in the World Cup last year. Lots of other things, but we'll get there. Mochadisi, I'm so glad to meet you. Good morning. Good morning, Ruda. It's so good to be interviewed by a veteran in the game. Thank you so much for having me today. Were you the first woman globally to anchor a, a, a World Cup or, or was that or just South African? I, I actually can't be sure. I'll definitely ask the team to, to just put in a bit of work in, in, in making sure that we know exactly um, the context of that. But <laughs> What a phenomenal day it was. Two sure. November 2019. It's etched in my heart and mind forever. I'll get back to that, but I want to take you back to the beginning first. You grew up in Katlehong, but mm. then you went to an Afrikaans high school. How and yeah. why and how did you experience that? So, <laughs> um, I was in Alberton Primary. Um, and Alberton is, is like the town, uh, one of the towns that's closest to, to our township, Katlehong. My mom worked in Alberton at the Union Hospital. She's a nurse. And my dad worked in Alberton. He was a sales consultant uh, for various furniture stores, uh, Bradlow's being one of them. So we'd literally go to school, after school, walk to dad, do our homework. If mom is working, wait for her, drive to mom, pick her up and go home. So that town became like... Um, my, my, my resting place. Most of my day was spent there. So one of the top high schools there is Mareful Yun. So it was Alton High and Mareful Yun. And I was very, very clear by probably early grade seven that I wanted to go to, to Mareful Yun. It's a dual medium school. So it's English and Afrikaans, but predominantly Afrikaans. And I went there because it was the best. And I considered myself to be the best. So I wanted to be in the best school. Um, it was a huge challenge uh, coming into the school, especially early on. Um, you would think that in 2002, the, the idea of a new South Africa, the idea of, of different races working together, schooling together, etc., cetera, would, would just be second nature. But it wasn't. And I found that the, the seniors in particular were, were very difficult. You know, and were you still very much the odd one out? How many black kids were there? Quite a few, quite a few, but not in the majority, not at all. Really in the minority. Maybe when I started in grade eight, about a hundred. I'd say okay. a hundred, uh, school body of a thousand, four thousand five hundred. So there wasn't a lot of us, but it was not necessary. You know, in primary school, I never had the notion of majority or minority or black and white. I was just a kid who went to school um, with a kaleidoscope of people, kaleidoscope of colors, kaleidoscope of, of, of uh, personalities as well. So it never dawned on me to be conscious of my blackness, you know. And I think high school is where it became stark and I had to um, realize that like a tree, when the wind blows, I have to get stiff. I have to get tough so that I'm not blown over. And it took a while for me to get in there. I mean, I remember telling my, my parents, my dad in particular, that nah, I don't want to be in the school anymore. Uh, those kids don't like us. They have no reason not to like us. Um, as the seniors, especially, because I would never get it uh, from my peers. But mm. the school taught me so much, so much that I'm using in my life today. Um, and introduced me to, to rugby. Uh, as grade eights, we'd have, to, we'd have to go and watch the first team play in our blazers, in the sweltering sun. Uh, so I hated it. I thought, oh, this is just the sport for bullies. All they do is bash into each other and we just sit there and cheer. Like, it makes no sense. No sense at all. So I grew up watching football with my dad. I played netball. I understood cricket, so I watched cricket as well. And here's this root sport that I have to now get accustomed to and also get accustomed to the culture. 
Um, and the I'm, whole school goes mad for rugby, of course. The, there's a, a, a there's a kind of yeah, there's a kind of madness that takes over when the first team is on the field. The whole school and you know they swagged up they got their blazers on walking around like they're kings of the school because they are kings of the school if you play with the first team you're considered a king um and that's really how i got into it i watched the parents come out um every saturday to to support their sons and i got i got got a glimpse into rugby culture and and the work that not only the players put in but the coaches and the parents because the for the, the family support is so big it is so so big um but yeah high school taught me to be strong it, it taught me to understand different kinds of people different kinds of cultures uh by the time i left i could speak more languages than i could count um because you have to adapt you have to learn mm. how to fit and you have to learn how to adapt but the early days i mean grade eight and grade nine very difficult yeah you could have done anything um, as you said in another interview, you were an overachiever. You, you, all paths were open. You chose to do accounting at UJ. How did you, why? Because um, I just loved the subject and I was really good at it. And, you know, I, in hindsight, I, I, I wonder about placing a decision like that on what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your career on the shoulders of 16, yeah. 17, and 18 year olds, you know? Um, but in that time, accounting just, I love numbers. I love balancing books. I, I, I love the allure of the vocation. I love that I was going to make tons of money, tons of money so that I could be the cool kid, make sure that my parents are taken care of. Um, so accounting became essentially my first love. And I did well at it. I think that was the other thing. I didn't, mm. I didn't open my mind to anything else because this is the thing that I'm really good at. So I might as well. Um, and then work. you coasted through first year, but yeah. then you stumbled in your second year. Um, uh, tell us why that happened. And was it a, was it a, a kind of wake up, wake up call? So, in second year, I started working at YFM. In first year, I joined UJFM. I was reading news on uh, The Breakfast Show with Nick V. And then YFM started looking for weekend newsreaders. And I went to the auditions and I got, I got the job. So I'm working weekends at Y. And then I think around August, September, I had to stand in for someone midday. And if you work midday, you had work at eight, you leave um, work at five-ish. Um, and then it's... Um, trying to get to the classes in the evening, being absolutely exhausted. So some of the time uh, I'm in the class with my eyes closed. <laughs> so I'm not taking anything in. And before you know it, I get to the end of my second semester and I failed four modules. And I was, it's not that I was doing any better in the first semester. I was getting by, I was doing well, but it was not up to the standard that I had set for myself in primary school and high school. Um, and I remember sitting even with my uh, lecturer in the first semester and she was like, your counting marks are not really great. Do you still want to go the CA route or, or do you want to pivot a little? And I was like, no, let's keep going and see what happens at the end of the year. End of the year comes four modules. You have not done well, ma'am. Uh, and then I had to go home and explain it to my parents and... Yeah, you lost the bursary, uh, so it was very kind of relevant I, for them. Yeah, I lost my bursary um, because my marks were not were not uh, good, and I, I would never hold a company uh, responsible for the next year when I haven't brought my parts to the table. And I think in hindsight, it was a time management thing. It was it was pouring my heart and soul into this into this radio gig, into doing radio, into becoming this great news reader, a, a great a news producer as well, and not being able to put in the same energy into my schoolwork. Mm -hmm. And I remember having the conversation with my parents, my dad, my mom and my dad. My mom, because she knew that I was always a tough student, was just like, okay, but it, it's clearly not the work. What is the actual problem? And I was like, mm -hmm. I just can't get the balance. I can't be working for eight hours and then studying another eight hours. And, mm -hmm. and I, my, I, I doff my hat off to anybody who works and studies at the same time. It is not easy at all. But my dad was like, okay, so what's the plan? And I was like, no, the plan is I'm gonna work, I'm gonna study, I'm gonna get my time management right, because now I have to work, because I have to pay for school. I'm not putting that burden on my parents. So I 
came in the next year, guns blazing. You know, I made sure. I'm in an evening class. I'm sitting there with my energy drink. I'm, I'm awake. I'm alert. I'm sitting with my friends most evenings. Guys, what was happening in this class? I don't understand this. I don't understand that. So I started opening myself up to a community of people that would be able to assist me. After completing your degree, um, you went to Metro, right? And you, you said in, in the same interview that I watched yesterday um, that you found that you had to learn the journalism skills, that you knew you were com coming across well, but you needed something else. So many people don't realize that. <laughs> what exactly was it that you felt you needed to learn? You know, the YFM was just the perfect playground because you learned everything. Everything that I know as, as a broadcaster, as, as even a journalist, I learned there at Y. And, and honing that skill over three and a half years, we, mm -hmm. we had to work hard. And my editor, my former editor, was not playing games. We were a very young newsroom, but he still expected the very best from us. And I think the move to Metro, where I'm no longer producing the news myself, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily involved in the production, the script just comes in and I have to reap off of it. I, I also realized that, but my, my, my host might want to ask me something. So now I have to get into the culture of still knowing what's going on, as if I'm producing the news still, and be able to banter back and forth uh, with the person on whose show I'm, I'm reading. So that's the added uh, skill that I, uh, that I needed in order to also flourish at, at Metro. And coming into Metro, the back of my audition as well. So 2011 was like a big change year for me. Mm -hmm. Was that the year that you entered the Lady Raga competition? for super sport and you you came third but it opened the door it did it really really did um i remember even when the ads were going out the newsroom knew about it and they were like no you have to go you have to go audition i'm like guys it's rugby they're like yeah it's rugby we learn go go for it you know um and i remember being at ellis park and thinking what on earth am i doing here why <laughs> you must represent us don't drop the ball you know um, and I did the audition. I think I was the eighth person to get green lighted that afternoon. What was late evening now? So even the producers had packed up and we were going straight to the judges. And I remember going in, um, reciting the lines, and, and the camera woman, Sia, I'll never forget her face. There was just something about how her face lit up when I was done that told me, ooh, ooh, some, something happened there. Some, something. Yeah happened there yeah um came third eventually after 1500 entrance and it was extraordinary it's extraordinary how sometimes you do things and you don't actually realize who's watching mm. you know you might not get the prize but someone has seen something special in you and they want to end up working with you or they have the power to take you to the next level of that craft and I'd never done television in my life, ever, ever, ever. Never stood in front of a camera. But I think my work in radio and just my self-belief and my self-confidence made the difference on audition day and in the days leading up to um, the finale. Um, what is it like now being a black woman in rugby? Uh, have you seen that whole scene change and shift? I mean, role models like yourself, like the guys, Sia and Lucanio and Mapimpi, um, it, it must make a huge difference for, for kids coming up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think as far as representation is concerned, it is huge. It is huge to see someone who looks like you, who's been through almost the same things that you have been through, flourishing at the highest level, because then it gives you extra belief that even your dreams can come true. So definitely that's a big one. It has changed. I think um, people are opening up more and more. It has taken a long time, obviously, because um, men especially will tune in, see a woman, and they're like, what does she know? You know, and I had a lot of those kinds of comments even when I did the final. Um, there was a gentleman that tweeted me and said, I switched on my TV and I saw this lady and I was like, what does she know? But you've blown me away. Oh, great. <laughs> and, and I, <laughs> I was like, that's not really a compliment. I mean, I extended grace. I, I, I responded kindly, 
But I read that's actually not a compliment. It's not a mm. compliment. To, it's not a compliment that you didn't even give me the benefit of the doubt when you saw my face. You assumed that I'm just there because, you know. Mm. Um, but slowly, and, slowly and uh, the tell me, changing. tell me about the the experience. You walk into whatever the uh, the booth at the at the game, or you sit with the guys. How are you accepted? Oh, fully, fully, and I can say that from day one. In fact, I think I think in my early days, I was the one with a lot of self doubt. A lot of self-doubt because I'm like it's like high school all over again I'm the anomaly I'm the odd one out I, I'm, I'm a woman I'm a black woman I'm in the sport that's predominantly white predominantly male um, and here's this girl that's coming up uh, trying to learn making sure she knows what she knows trying to tell these beautiful stories because at varsity cup level where I started it was the stories of triumph the stories of young men that are coming through the ranks and the next thing you know they're getting their franchise contracts next thing you know they're playing for the Springboks. but you interviewed them two years ago when they were just leading a tax or just leading a UJ or a bits so it's it's I had to learn to not look without for my confidence and my and, and, and my knowledge and to find myself I had to look within I had to refine my craft from within I had to grow in my confidence in my confidence of myself in confidence of my knowledge in 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 saying to myself you know what you're doing you know what you're doing you know what you're doing you know and and the more and more that bolt then it's then then it's easier to be comfortable it's easier to go into a, a commentators meeting and sit there comfortably. And, I, and I've always known to ask questions, even when they sound stupid, because there must be someone that's wondering the same thing that I'm wondering. <laughs> um, but from day one, the team, the whole team, a crew, a talent, all of them just had my back and they were like, yo, let's go. Let's be great. So tell me about the day of the World Cup. Um, you phoned home, the, was it the night before or on that morning? And that said, ah, a gunny, a gunny. I remember waking up and it was actually raining in Joburg. So I knew that was a good omen um, because in my culture, that means great blessings. And it had not been raining in the lead up. No, but it rained on that day. So I knew it was going to be a good day. And, but I was so nervous, terribly nervous. And I was driving to the office, listening to my music, trying to soothe myself. And then I parked the car at work. And from a distance, I could see the guys getting uh, coffee at the coffee station. But they're all in the, in the Springbok jerseys. And I'm like, sheesh, they believe. They believe like I believe. So I got out the car. I'm like, guys, are we winning the World Cup? What, what kind of questions are those, man? Yes, of course, we're winning the World Cup. Get inside, go do your makeup. Hurry, hurry. And I walked in, <laughs> so nervous, sat in the makeup chair. I'm saying my little prayers, getting my face done. And then... I get on set, we take a couple of pictures and then I sit, I'm going through my notes. Um, and then just the enormity of the moment just caught me, you know, ah, oh, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. And then I called home and I was like, mom, it's too big. It's, it's too big. I'm, I'm scared. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'll be able to show up the way I want to show up. Wow, I've never spoken about this and cried. This is weird. Mm -hmm. Ruda, what are you doing to me? <laughs> and she said, of course it's big. And that's why you're there, because it is so big. You know, you are capable, you are worthy, you are strong enough, you're big enough. So pray and then call dad, call your grandmother, tell them to be in the room with you, tell them to, to take up that space with you, ask them to guide you, ask them to shine their light. Take a deep breath and go. And she prayed for me. And then I was like, okay, I've got to go. It's five minutes to air. Hung up on her. And then I did that. I prayed. I asked my dad to be in the room. I asked my grandmother to be in the room. Those are the, the two big losses that I suffered over the, the two years prior to the final. And my dad died literally two days before the Rugby World Cup started. So even in those early days, I couldn't be part of, of, of the team and the productions. And then I just felt calm and light, calmness. And, and a sense of light. And I remember my director, Evie, was like, what, are you ready to go? We're ready to go. Two minutes to the biggest show in the world, guys. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And three, two, one, and it just rolls. And 
something else which is on like people who do live television will know like you can be as nervous and as scared as or how but once you see that red light once you know the cameras are rolling there's just there's just your 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 talent your being takes over and and you just calm and you just go and i remember like a few months i was like Good morning, it's, this, it's very similar to it's very similar to a sports person, you know, say mm. a tennis player. Mm. That the moment you start, you at the on the best days, you get into that flow, and then yes. it's so fantastic. That's the word. Um, tell me about tell me about your your Instagram show that you've started. Why and how and how is it working out? Oh, it's called Mindful Moments, and I have it every Tuesday at six o'clock, and it's really, I wanted, I wanted to, sh to reveal a different side of me, both as a broadcaster, but just as a human being. And my team at Duma Collective had been saying for a while that, you know, um, everybody knows you as the sports woman. Let's have conversations that are outside of sports because we want people to understand that you are a whole human being and there are other issues um, that you would like to talk about or like to enlighten people about. So that's why I started Mindful Moments. Um, it's, it's been so much fun. I've learned so much from it as well because that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted, to, I wanted it to be educational. I wanted it to be informative. I wanted it to be enlightening. I wanted people to walk away from the conversations I have with um, the great people I've had on feeling, feeling inspired, but also maybe having had their perceptions shifted somewhere you know we, we spoke about mental health spoke about drug addiction um we spoke about finances your personal finances getting your money right uh, so many conversations that we've had about um the full ministry uh, the sports broadcasting industry and yesterday actually uh, yesterday's date the 27th of october i had my final one for season one um where i was just doing a q a with with everybody that had been participating and just wanted to ask me uh, some questions about career so season two will be loading very very soon but it has been a beautiful labor of love and i and they're all there if you want to ever go watch and i hope you're inspired and i hope if anything i can change your mind about just one thing then i've done my job it's such a different platform um you know it's a completely new new way of reaching out to an audience um how many followers do you have or how many people watch? I'm not sure how to ask that. I have 24,000 followers now on Instagram. My Instagram grows very slowly. Uh, but we, I get about 500 views on average. So people will come in and out and in and out. And then mm. once I pick them up, the, the views start to grow, grow again. But usually when I'm live, I have a very small audience. But even that audience is, is worthy of the very best, which is what I always try and do for them, to make sure that they just... They, they feel lighter when, when they walk away from, from mindful moments. You know, the one thing, um, moving on to your family and, and your background and so on, the, the one thing that really strikes me is that your parents must have been, in bringing you up, completely amazing. Because <laughs> that confidence that you have, that, that self-assured, um, there's no arrogance. But there's a, I know who I am, I know what I can do. That can only come from, from parents. And you were alone, uh, your mum went away to work for about five years when you were in your early teens, huh? Yeah. And you yeah. Were, your dad was just there. Tell he me was about a superstar. Him. He was a superstar, yes. My mom went to work um, in Saudi Arabia on and off for a period of five years. That was a very, very difficult time. And I could see the toll it was also taking on, on my dad um, mentally, uh, mm. physically as well. But, but yeah, because we were some naughty little teens, you know. <laughs> so it was an adjustment for him, but it was also an adjustment for us. And it made me realize how, um, just how much of a ray of sunshine my mother was. Uh, to my dad as well. So mm -hmm. but, but the one thing I will always respect about my father is his insistence that my mom must go and conquer this challenge. You know, he was never going to be the person to hold her back. He wanted her to go and to experience um, that life, to experience working in another country, um, 
And just because we were the beneficiaries of it doesn't mean that he was not rooting for her always. And, and I will forever, you know, hold him in high regard for that because I feel like many women put their dreams on the back burner to raise their children. And my mom was lucky to be with a person that said, I know you have this dream. You've been talking about it for a while. Go, even if it's for a year. If, if, you, if you can't cut it for a year, come back. We'll be here. You know, it took a toll on him, but he was resolute. And I think that's why I'm also so, so resolute, so strong. I persevere. Um, my patience wanes a lot thinner now that I'm getting older. <laughs> um, but that's what my father was. He was, he, he persevered. He was strong. He knew exactly what he, who and what he was. He was the most confident man you've ever met. He would charm your socks off. You wouldn't believe that he was the strict person that I would have described to you as, as, as my friend. So, so that's where I got it from. But the diligence, the calm, uh, the, the kind heart, the generosity, I definitely say that's, that's, that's more from mommy because she's... But it's, she's you know, Mutalisi, it's, it's so important for a girl child to have that relationship with your father. Oh, yes. Because your father is the first man you love. Oh, yes. And how the, you, the two people interact shapes not only your view of yourself as a woman and what, you, what you're capable of, but also of relationships. Huh? And, and also shapes how you interact with the rest of the world and with yes. other men in particular. You know, my father was always work hard, read your books, have an opinion, would, would argue all the time. Even he'd tell me the sky's pink and would find an argument for it. And we'd sit there and I'm like, Dad, it cannot be pink. This is what's going on. You know, and I think without even knowing, he kind of shaped me for even the work that I'm doing today, that I have this 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 confidence that even I don't know where it comes from. But it's so innate that 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 um, I may go away for a while and come back to you, but I won't necessarily cower. And, and that's what he honed in me. My mom is the, is the disciplinarian, quick discipline, but she's the calm, big smiles, generous, happy place, serenity. She doesn't like chaos. My dad was the more, maybe the chaos <laughs> guy. And you see, so that, that, that perfect balance is, is always needed. And so what would you, if you can, summarize it if you can find the essence what if one day you were to have children what do you want to teach them that you learned from your parents oh wow to be grounded i think mm. to be grounded you know to be grounded and to really know who you are to know to know that you are here to also answer prayers that are 100, 200 years old, to know that you are incredible. Just by being, you are incredible. To show up for yourself, for your family, for other people. My father was a huge time man. He taught me to respect time, respect people's time. Don't arrive late. Don't show up late. And when I show up late, I will apologize for 10 minutes because it is, Terribly disrespectful. And he told me that. You have a meeting, you're there, 10 to. If you're there at the time the meeting starts, you're late. That's what my father told me. But also just hard work and putting in the 100%, you know. Work smart, yes, but work hard. Nobody owes you anything. You've got to work hard. You've got to show up. But from my mom, I, I would say also the diligence because my mom saves people for a living, you know. Yeah. And she takes on a lot because she is an empath. She's watching people go from breaking all their bones in a car accident to becoming this whole human being again. So that patience, that patience with people, extending kindness even when they can't because they're so frustrated with where they are. That generosity, not just of stuff, but of love, of, of time, of understanding, of, of hearing people and comprehending what they are saying. That's what I would, I would teach them for my parents. They just had the perfect kind of balance um, so while we are firecrackers at home, we, we, we get to that place of ease very easily. Yeah. And just to end on a, on a more practical note, um, 
where is that place for you? What does your home look like? Uh, when you get home after a, a day that has just been too long, what do you want around you? How do you recharge your batteries? And how do you structure your physical surroundings to do that? Oh, that's a very good question. I'm still awaiting my furniture. <laughs> <laughs> because I've done quite a few changes. Um, but a home for me is now um, coming home to stillness mostly because the work that we do has us buzzing. So it takes a while to get down from that high. So I want to come home to preferably silence or just laid back music. Um, I'll, I'll light some incense or burn some candles and, and come into a space of prayer and meditation. But when I go home, I go home to my niece's hugs. I go home to, oh my gosh, tell me about your day. Oh, this is my day. <laughs> Um, and, and to laughter and to love and, and, and both of those for me are, are perfect. They represent home where it's warm, where you feel wanted, where you feel welcomed, where you feel welcomed. That's home. Which it is. Thank you so much. And, um, all of the very, very, very best. You still have a long career ahead of you and I'm sure we're going to see much, much more of you. I said to my husband yesterday when I watched an interview with you, the country's okay because the next generation is coming through and they are great. <laughs> so. love that. I absolutely love that. And we are. We are. I think the younger generation, our generation, and, and maybe five, ten years, the, the, the gap, you know, the 90s kids and the early 2000 kids, while they do things a lot more differently, especially because of the way the world works now, they really just do want the best, you know. It's not orthodox. It's not the methodology that we used to. But I hope even parents support them as well because their endeavor is still to be the best that they can be and to do the best um, for the world and to change the world. So even if you don't agree with their methodology, do support them. <laughs> well, on that very positive note, we say goodbye until next time. And I thank my guest again. Thanks, Muchadisi. Thank you.